Um, I was pondering what to talk about and a few weeks ago when, when the talks were out, and I was thinking that a lot of people, and particularly at this conference over the last few years, there's a lot of very, I guess, technical sessions, there's a lot of discussions around Docker, and there's a lot of you know, hands-on, really kind of detail about how to implement Drupal. Um, my talk is going to focus a little bit more on, I guess, the business problems around Drupal, what, what kinds of things you might solve by using a Drupal solution, rather than necessarily getting too down into the nuts and bolts. And I'll pre present some examples throughout, and by the way, they're not examples that, that I've necessarily done or been involved in, or our company has. There's a whole range of things from kind of around the globe. Just to get people thinking about what might be possible in terms of your Drupal solution. Um, I did come up with some, with some alternative titles, so 10 things you can do with Drupal that you might not think are possible. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but I took out all the bad and the ugly ones and left all the pretty sites in, so you can um, hopefully enjoy uh, a little bit about what Drupal can do um, beyond um, the simple kind of static sites that we see a lot. Uh, so for those that don't know me, uh, I'm Ian Laslett, and I have worked for 15 years in, I guess, digital, and that starts with application-based um, projects, social media, web developments, uh, and for the last eight years I was managing director of Adelphi Digital in Australia. Um, we grew the business from virtually nothing to around 100 staff, um, focused on content management system implementations, uh, particularly for government and large corporates. Um, so we've done lots and lots of work with, with big organisations and in Canberra here with lots and lots of government clients. I also have a range of uh, knowledge about different CMSs. So Although I, we work with Drupal a lot, particularly in Canberra, uh, around the, the country we work with a whole range of platforms for delivering things online and we get to see, I guess, the best of what the commercial sector has to offer as well. Uh, thank you to Nathan and Toby for their talk about GovCMS, but I think GovCMS is really the tip of the iceberg when you think about what Drupal is and what you can do with it. Um, the, Currently, as of last night, there were 242 sites on GovCMS, which is very impressive, actually, for the last few years. Um, obviously, Drew, uh, the GovCMS platform's only been running for a couple of years. Um, but on the other hand, Drupal in general, there are over 1.1 million sites out there um, that serve a variety of purposes and a variety of um, needs. And I guess thinking about what um, GovCMS does, it's great and it's very, very useful, and we use it a lot uh, in government it only delivers probably a very, very thin slice of the overall features and functionality that you can get from uh, Drupal in general. So bear that in mind when you're thinking about your next implementation, about what you want to achieve from that site. Don't think about it just in terms of what you might be possible with GovCMS. I don't know we have a big government audience that's been here in Canberra, but think about what might be possible with Drupal in general. So what are the challenges um, and why would you want to think about doing something beyond a simple informational site uh, using Drupal? What challenges must be overcome to understand and improve your user's digital experience? Now, in terms of usability, there are huge um, challenges. And if you pick a standard theme and go off and deliver something um, just using that theme, you're going to run into potentially some usability challenges. Um, there is fear of using content management systems. I know at this kind of conference you don't really see it, but we talk to a lot of users who don't, still don't understand what a content management system is, why they might want to use it, what the issues are um, with content management systems, and what the positives are around using GovCMS. I want to talk a little bit about business processes and how you might integrate those into your um, Drupal platform. Integration in general, and how you might integrate a range of offerings across into your um, solution. And also the support system that's out there beyond um, what's available in uh, the simple, um, straightforward world of a standard CMS. So let's first of all talk about usability. What we see a lot, I guess, from users around the country and around the globe is that um, traditionally users can't find content on sites. You know, your information architecture is terrible. Um, you get a lot of feedback on your site that says it's poor, it's useful, it's useless. Um, I can't find content, I can't find information, it's not relevant for me. My bounce rates are really, really high. I mean, just looking at simple analytics, seeing what people are doing and finding out that they go to your site, they disappear a few seconds later because they can't find what they want. Um, and one of the biggest issues and one of the things I'll talk a little bit about today is that search in general um, is a major issue across sites. Um, people are not 
um, realizing the full potential of search, how to make it work, and they think that search might work a lot like Google, when in fact it's very hard to make a search work like Google on your website. The other thing that we see a lot with usability is that existing templates, if you um, use a theme that, that's out there already, it doesn't give you the features that you need. You want to do something more feature rich or enhanced designs, um, you need to go off and do something a little bit more custom. So, one of the things to consider in your implementation is that you need to be looking at personalization. And personalization should not just be about um, you know, providing just geolocation, it should be looking at your audience and what your users want to achieve from that site and coming up with a personalised experience based upon what that user does. Um, it's very, very important, I think, in, in the modern world, when you're out browsing, the, the sites that you all see day in, day out, if you're on Amazon, if you're on Apple, if you're on the Google sites, they're all providing a constant stream of personalised information to you. You need to be thinking in terms of what your site can be doing that is personalised for you. Making your site automated, making it go faster and smarter, making it real um, for the users to get to the content that they need without necessarily getting stuck um, doing um, simple repetitive processes. You know, recently in our um, acquisition into EY, we've been, I guess, subjected to a whole range of internal systems. And it's what struck me as I came across from, a, I guess, a more small agile business into a large business was how much um, inconsistency there was across the, the different platforms that are out there. How many different times you have to enter the same information. And it's the same for users of any of your sites. If you're online and you're accessing a government portal, why do you have to enter the same information again? Why can't you use a single sign-on? Why can't you do um, any degree of automation to pre-populate the information that's available to your users? Um, so think about that when you're developing your sites. So I just wanted to talk, talk through a couple of examples, first of all. Um, hopefully my internet's working. Yeah. Um, if you want to build a site that offers, I guess, a range of search, uh, additional search and, and fancy design features over what you might achieve from a standard GovCMS site, um, doing things like building in... Uh, building in faceted search, building in your um, video content, building in uh, taxonomy into the site are all important to make sure that when you're building a site, that you can deliver something that users can really see and engage with. Um, it's very, very easy to build a Drupal site, stand up the standard Drupal search, and then your users will be disappointed with the outcome. So I think it's very, very important that you look at the search options that are out there and really try and um, add something on top of what you're trying to achieve um, for those users. Make it more engaging, make it more interactive, and make search really work for, for the users. Do some testing with those users to try and uncover how that search works um, across the site. Um, just globally, there's lots and lots of sites, and I was looking at some of um, some interesting Drupal sites um, over the next over the uh, in preparing this talk, doing things like providing um, different sorts of navigation, so providing um, simple mega menus that really speak to what you're trying to achieve. If you're a student visiting the University of Toronto, providing really simple ways to access content, providing things that give them. Um, quick and easy ways to get access to the things that they need. If you're new, try and find the information that's relevant to them very, very fast using these, this kind of tabbed um, view. So you shouldn't be limited in terms of the design, you shouldn't be limited in terms of the engagement that you're trying to achieve from your site um, by just uh, what is available um, in your standard kind of Drupal templates. I just want to bring up this one as well because it offers a range, uh, and people might not realise, but um, the Weather Channel, which I think serves like 100 million page views a day, and people were talking about GovCMS serving maybe a million page views a day kind of thing. There's sites out there on Drupal that are um, personalised and providing 100 million um, pieces of traffic a day. Now, I did no information, I entered no information into this site, and it already knows that I'm in Canberra, it knows what I, that my temperature should be in um, Celsius, and there's a whole bunch of contextual information that's provided um, directly in the site without you entering or doing anything about it. And I think it's important that when you're thinking about um, your users, that when they come to the site, they're provided with a contextual experience for you based upon where, you, where they are at that time. Um, the next thing I want to cover, I guess, is in terms of fear of using CMS. A lot of people are very, uh, feel that they need training, but it should be, you know, that if you're sat there, um, it's going to be very hard to learn how to use the product. You know, people come to us and say, oh, you know, can you run you know, days and days of training for our content authors and content publishers on how to manage the site, it really shouldn't be that hard to, to manage those things. A lot of people say their users are not technical. 
But content management systems and the web these days is designed to be not technical. It's designed for your users to be simple, to be simple and easy for, for them to use. People say they only publish content really, really that's fine. Um, that makes it all the more important that when you design your product and you design the way your CMS is implemented, that you make it in a way that's simple and easy to use. Um, I can't start a lawnmower, let alone drive a CMS. Well, there's a few things to talk about there. Um, in terms of the, the resolutions to these problems, introducing simple WYSIWYG publishing into your workflow, making sure your workflow is really, really simple. I've seen a lot of examples where people try and implement their business model into their workflow. So when you're publishing content, you don't want to reproduce the fact that you've got you know, 27 different sections and everyone owns a tiny little different part of the site. If you go off and do that, you're going to create a huge overhead in managing the content for your site. So making sure that your workflow is simple and easy to use. Now in terms of your, your lawnmower and whether you can't start it, use an electric lawnmower or in this case completely change the way that you manage and edit content. I just want to talk for a little bit about the fact that um, people speak to computers these days and people speak to their devices all the time. People are getting Google Home, people are talking onto their mobile phones all the time. Um, if you are not building search controls that um, allow users to use their voice, then you could be leaving a lot of your users behind. So becoming um, voice control is becoming very, very popular on sites and is, is something that you really should be thinking about considering implementing into your site. Um, Gartner is saying that um, sites that implement voice control um, will be able to implement increased digital commerce uh, revenue by 30%. So it's something to really think about when you're designing and implementing your site is looking at the, the potential for voice control. The other thing to think about in terms of content is um, users say that 90 uh, percent of users say about when you're buying something or considering a service that a video is helpful in the decision process and this can be really helpful with training. Um, recent examples have shown that when uh, property sites that we've built have uh, included video content, the amount of views that you get on those property sites has increased by 400 percent. So the engagement with your audience is much, much higher if you're using video content. Something to really think about when you're developing your site. I just wanted to do a quick example of how easy it would be uh, to implement uh, speech recognition on your site, you can do something as simple as having a tiny JavaScript library. Uh, so if I go on here and say hello, hello, oh, it's decided not to work. Hello, of course demos never work, even though it was working before. So what's meant to happen? I think I assume because it's uh, because I'm projecting. Um, the, the, um, the web page engages with you and you can um, run all your search commands through it, you can run um, all your, um, uh, any of the other commands that you might run through the site, you can run by using voice control. And apologies that that's not working. It was working yeah, before. No. Loud, and it was working just before. I assume it's something to do with projecting. <laughs> but anyway, I guess the point is that, um, that that is a simple JavaScript library. You can add it onto the front of any site, and then you can implement some voice controls into it. So you can have it refer off to your search engine by using uh, uh, voice control. Let's talk about business processes for a second. Um, I need to deliver functionality to my users. My needs, users need to access forms and systems. I need to sell products. And I don't want 10 different online portals for my teams to use. So understanding your business process and understanding what your users want to achieve from your site is very, very important. It's also important to present a consistent experience for those users across your digital um, platforms. Um, in terms of solutions, certainly work uh, in a way that speaks to your users, go out and do your user research, um, follow the digital ser service standard, if, if you're, particularly if you're working in government, but it's actually very applicable in the broader industry sense as well. So go out, do your research, under, uncover what your users really want to achieve, um, redevelop your business processes and test them using alpha and beta, um, take those prototypes out and test them in the real world. Uh, you don't have to test with your millions and millions of users straight up, but you certainly have to go out and test with real users to get feedback on how things work or don't work. Um, I just wanted to talk through quickly a site that uh, offers a range of personalization and other features on it. So 
because I've visited this site previously, it comes back with context for me. It says catch up with previous events and things that you've done on your site. So why, when you're considering users who are visiting your site, why don't you give them some context that they've been there before and present different information to them? Um, if not, obviously there's a range of um, content available to you. If I want to buy something, um, maybe I'm very interested in body lotion. Um, there's a lot of contextual information about um, users who are providing feedback on the site. Um, there's uh, people talking about what's happening in, in the social platforms all at the same time. I think it's these kind of features that you really want to think about engaging and interacting with your audience across the site. So rather than just having your site presented as a pool of information, it actually needs to um, engage with both your e-commerce platform, engage with your social, and engage with your personalization to show that um, you really understand what your users want. Um, so this site actually um, had a really large um, percentage increase once they in, in sales once they introduced the personalization features across the site. Um, this is something that uh, a massive uh, Netherlands uh, publishing company and they offer a range of features around personalization in terms of um, cooking and videos and things like that. And every time you come back it prompts you with recipes and things around uh, things that you've viewed in the past. So if you're interested in um, cooking cakes and things like that, you get a lot of um, personalised information based upon those cakes um, that you've viewed in the past. I wanted to bring an example more close back to home. Um, working here in Canberra with the Director of Public Prosecutions, um, their intranet, which is called eHub, provides a range of personalised content and features um, that engages both with their uh, Active Directory content, so it has single sign-in, um, it enables business processes to happen, so there's a workflow tool built into the intranet so that people can request jobs um, and get content delivered back to them based upon the jobs that they've requested. So if, they're, if a lawyer is requesting some particular piece of information, the administrative team has a whole, a whole system in there where they can go off and um, action that request and have a workflow, effectively a ticket management system through their intranet. There's also direct ability to talk between people, um, and an electronic uh, organisation chart that works based upon the, the uh, integration with the Active Directory. So there's a lot more you can do with a simple site and a range of integrations rather than just having it presented as static content. Unfortunately, that's on an internet, so I can't present all the features to you, but it's something to think about. Um, further on integration, um, a lot of people these days, and when we get um, briefs, most of the time these days it says something like, uh, I want to integrate with this particular platform, I want to integrate with my CRM, I need to have my social part of my overall solution. Uh, I have lots and lots of legacy systems, which is the biggest issue probably at the moment. Most um, people will find that when they are going out to implement a site, there's probably 10 or 15 different technologies at play, and they need to figure out how they're going to integrate and possibly work with all those technologies to make them all work together. Um, in terms of solutions, things like providing a single sign-on are very, very important, so your users never get that context that they're switching between different places, that they're always engaged in the same platform, in the same portal. Um, social content is very, very important, as I showed in that example from Lush, that, that where there is content that's being driven on your social channels, that needs to be integrated back into your site so you can really get some, drive some engagement across your site and some communication with the users who are using your site. Um, most days, these days, people are running a CRM um, and they want to know who's using their site, what registrations they have, um, what kind of, and that can then drive your personalization features once you know what your users are doing on your sites. And um, certainly not least of all, I should provide a consistent user experience across all my platforms despite the underlying technology. Um, this one is a big one, I think, and it's something I'll, I'll just touch on a little bit more. When you're designing a, a solution, I think you shouldn't just be think thinking about what that single point solution is these days. You should be thinking about, well, how can I apply a design language across a range of platforms? So um, rather than necessarily having 25 um, different portals for doing all kinds of different things, take the front end, um, set up a design language and really go and work with that platform um, and skin that across a whole range of your solutions. Um, and that way, your users won't get the context that they're jumping between a whole bunch of different technologies um, and it really provides a lot of example. Uh, another thing to think about is your search, making sure your search works across all your digital platforms so it's consistent if you're running um, portals, if you're running a website, if you're running mobile apps and all those things, you should be able to provide a degree of consistency in how that search works so that users always understand how they can get to the right content. 
Um, one thing to think about in terms of integrations, and this is um, some work that uh, Asada released recently, was, and there's a separate talk on this at, on at the moment, so I'll just touch on it here so you don't miss out. Um, there are ways that you can publish content directly from your CMS into your app, and this was actually done with GovCMS as well as the, the back end. So the website actually um, has an API, and the mobile app goes out and pulls out a whole range of um, supplement content directly from within the CMS. Just something to think about when you're designing and implementing your next site, that it might be worth integrating your app publishing directly into your CMS as well. Um, another interesting site, I guess, in terms of integrations and, and something that, that, that Drupal does a lot of is when you're um, designing, I guess, a tourism and, and commerce site, there's probably four or five different platforms that uh, you need to integrate with. So in this case, there's a booking platform, um, there's uh, some tourism providers who can provide content based upon um, them selling and, and engaging um, in Basel. Um, and once again, the integrations here are presented seamlessly to the users so that they can um, go off and book accommodation, they can go off and engage um, with their local tourism providers without being directed off to a whole range of different portals. So it's something to consider about that presents a, a kind of consistent design experience across all, um, all the digital channels that are available for Basel is, um, is that kind of consistent design language. Once again, more close to home, I guess working um, locally here with ACT Health, um, this provides a range of integrations off into both their, um, their Active Directory systems, their hospital management systems, so you can see things like hospital wait times and stuff, um, and integrations across into their clinical apps uh, and things like that. What we tried to do here with ACT Health is pr present um, a consistent design language, and ACT Government, for those that don't know, has actually been working on a, a consistent design language across all their sites. So everything that you see across ACT Government over the next um, six to 12 months is gonna have a very consistent design, a consistent style, and things like that as well. And I think the, the, the true benefit for that will be the, thus those of us living in Canberra is that you'll be able to jump on any of the ACT government portals and not feel like that you're off in, in a different world, that they're all gonna be presenting information to you in a similar way, and that you're gonna be, um, the design language is gonna be si similar, even though the content and the, the structure of those sites is managed locally by the ACT directorates. Um, and that's something that's, I think, really, really great for a, a government the size of the ACT really to, to push something like that. So just going back a step, I guess, and thinking about what people need to achieve. Um, when you're designing and implementing your site, thinking about communication, thinking about what the communication needs are, thinking about the collaboration needs of your site, thinking about what functionality you want, thinking about what processes and, and um, functionality you need to implement in your site, thinking about where your documents are gonna be stored, how you're gonna manage and surface those documents through search, and thinking about personal con connectivity are all important when you're thinking about what might be possible with your Drupal site. Um, on the other hand, there are lots and lots of issues and we find lots of the times that people really struggle with the idea of outdated content, that there is a lack of ownership around the content. There's no planned renewal or archive of, of content, so you get in a situation where your site is always feeling like it was out of date. So when you're designing your site, thinking about your content archival and content um, renewal process is something you really need to, to consider while you're designing and implementing your site. So you don't end up with ads for Whitlam being sacked, or, or newspaper of Whitlam being sacked on your homepage. Um, Search, as I mentioned before, is a massive issue. And probably the things that really make your search not work are a complete lack of uh, metadata. Uh, a lot of people still just publish content without thinking underneath in terms of what the metadata is. Um, developing a taxonomy of terms across your content so you know um, what people are using, what kind of search terms they're gonna come across, and linking that taxonomy up so you can have related items. Um, People still want their search to work like Google, and it probably will never work exactly like Google, but you can make it work a lot better in some ways on just that site by providing a degree of refinement, by providing those facets, and providing um, the ability, in particular, to search things like documents. Now, most sites have a huge range of PDF documents, video content, all kinds of other stuff, but you need to be considering how you're gonna index and implement those things into your search engine as well, so they're easily found. In terms of integrations, aim to provide a single sign-on, aim to integrate with your CRM, aim to build forms and, and functionality and documents all in a consistent way that's, that's treated for your users, and make sure you do use that consistent design language. Make sure your design language is applied across your portal, your mobile app, your CRM, your CMS, and every other um, piece of content that you're gonna publish out to your external users. And that can go as far as providing the consistent user experience and across into your um, physical locations and things like that as well. 
Another thing to think about, I guess, is that um, implementing chatbots into your site. Um, chatbots are here and they're getting a lot, lot better. I mean, a couple of years ago, everyone knew when you were speaking to a chatbot. These days, you can go on a lot of sites and it's not necessarily immediately obvious where you're speaking to a chatbot. Um, Chatbots are being deployed in government agencies all around the country and those are both hooked into their call centres, so you've got people directly talking to users in call centres and also um, using artificial intelligence chatbots to actually respond to consistent queries and things like that as well. So where there's a, an issue that is raised consistently by a user base, setting up a chatbot that can answer those kind of simple repetitive questions is something that's pretty straightforward and easy to do these days. Um, Certainly artificial intelligence and chatbots is where um, there's a huge amount of investment at the moment. Um, traditional mobile app development is probably gradually on the decline. Things like artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain and those kinds of things are somewhere that you need to be thinking about investing for your future and for your digital future as well. I just want to touch briefly on the challenge of the support community, um, particularly with something with Drupal. Um, a lot of people are worried that if they build something that they can't support it, that the modules that they have uh, don't do do what I want or they don't provide exactly the features that they want. You know, there's like 250,000 different calendar modules out there for Drupal, but none of them ever seem to be exactly right for the use case that you're working on. So, you know, it's often the case, uh, and, and out of those 250,000, there's probably five of them that are actually actively maintained. So, um, there's often limited online help if you're going to use a, a community module out there to, to actually help you implement the solution. And you may want to control your drone from your CMS, which is something that could be a lot more fun as well. Um, and I know Toby and, and Nathan touched on this. Drupal is a very active community and growing fast in Australia. A few years ago, it was almost impossible. There was a, about five years ago, there was a, uh, I think there was probably 10 or 20 people working actively in Drupal in, in Canberra. And now I had a quick look uh, last night and there was about 120 jobs directly in Drupal in the last six months in Canberra. So it's something to really think about that the community's really grown rapidly over this period. Um, the other thing I would, I would stress is that um, work with a design and support team to deliver um, your own custom modules and features. Don't always assume that the community will provide you exactly what you need. The community is great, but the community often gives you a starting point for ideas and solutions, but it doesn't give you the full picture. Um, certainly I'd stress um, working with a partner or an agency to go out there and look at what you can deliver beyond what's available in the, in the community. Um, and finally, on the drone one, why can't I control my drone from the CMS? Well, maybe you can, and I was looking into this and doing a bit of research about drone control um, using CMS commands, and it may be possible that you could actually build a headless CMS that you could control a drone um, from within your CMS, so you build all the controls into your um, CMS. And it's something that you might want to think about for the future is what other technologies and what other things are going to be integrated across into your, your digital platforms. Just a few more things, I think, to touch on. Um, Augmented reality is becoming really cheap and really accessible, something that you want to build in, into your site. Um, things like Furniture Showcase, I mean, this is an example here. Um, in this particular site, you can go in and, and have a picture of a room, and in that you can swap the furniture around, so you just change how the, the room looks completely um, within an app um, or within, the, within a website. So um, augmented reality is, is really becoming very, very popular, particularly in um, property and particularly in design type sites. Um, so something to really think about is how can you augment reality in your um, site. Virtual reality on top of augmented reality will go from a niche place in the industry. So rather than, um, you know, if you want to take a tour of a property, you can take a complete virtual reality tour of something in a 3D space. That's something that's already common and something that you should really be thinking about if you're doing I don't know, a campaign or a, a promotion of a, a particular, you know, we're working at the moment with the National Library on something um, around Cook in the Pacific. Why not offer a, a digital immersive technology so that they go on and take a viewer of the exhibition um, using virtual reality? Um, so there's a lot more you can do with your CMS than just simple content. Um, it will take a little while though. Producing virtual reality content is quite, still quite challenging and does take a fair amount of time to get there. Um, and particularly to produce a really good user experience does take a fair amount of time. I think analytics is the next big area you need to focus on. Um, and I was talking before about personalization and how that works. It's certainly relevant to all of you users out there to go and understand how they're accessing your content, how they're accessing what um, your devices, um, where they're coming from, what they're actually doing there. Um, analytics has really grown massively over the last few years. And I strongly suggest that rather than just building a site and implementing Google Analytics, you actually take a, a step back and think, well, 
let's look at what, what options are there for more predictive analytics. What else could we do that will integrate a, a broader understanding of what my users are trying to achieve? Uh, Google Analytics is great, but it provides a very surface layer about what users are doing on your site. And there's a whole bunch of platforms and data that you can produce, um, particularly if you have registrations, particularly if you have processes on your site um, that you can really capture and improve the user experience for people. Um, the other thing to think about is how you might use blockchain technologies. Um, blockchain traditionally, um, for those that don't know, you know, you have a single clearinghouse, something like a bank that holds a record of an account. When you're thinking about blockchain, you're thinking about a distributed service where you have um, no central clearinghouse, where you have all records in sync. So if you're um, providing a, uh, I don't know, a transactional system or something like that, why not consider blockchain for the security side of it? Um, why do you have a single database sitting at the, the bottom of it that, um, that holds all the records? If that database fails, or if you've got problems with that, then you lose all the functionality of your site. Why not use something like a distributed model um, for managing all the data and managing the security around how, you, um, how your users will interact with your records? Just a few things to think about in a kind of more practical way. Um, there are a whole bunch of helpful modules out there that you might want to consider, and some of these are not, uh, and certainly not integrated into to GovCMS. So something to, um, you might want to add in a whole bunch stack of these modules, and it can make your site work really, really easy and really, really quickly. Um, and these are ones that are, are probably pretty commonly used for everyone. Um, but most aren't perfect, and will require some technical help to make sure that they work. Um, I know Drupal, in, in essence, is a simple content site. It's pretty straightforward, but um, to go beyond, I guess, a simple content site, you're going to need a little bit of technical help to get there as well. And just in other news, as mentioned before, uh, Adelphi Digital uh, was, um, for those that used to know us as Adelphi, and we've been that way for the last few years, um, we were acquired a couple of weeks ago by EY, um, and um, that's a really big opportunity for us and for you guys as well, because EY are really investing into the digital technology space um, over the next few years. Thank you. Any questions? I, I think you're right. I mean, adding back to the community is something that the open source community really, you know, prides itself on. And it's something that um, where possible you should always be doing. You know, if you're if you're building and improving a, a contrib module and, and you, you know, you see errors in it or you see things that you fixed and stuff, why not contribute it back to the community and make sure that people are uh, using it? And actually, it was one of the things we did recently was a whole big license review about how we're using open source technology. And, and a lot of those licenses do say if you are contributing that you have to contribute it back to the community as well. So it's something to be aware of if you are building your own stuff that if you're taking that, that kind of base module to start with, that you should be communicating it back, um, contributing it back to the community as well.
I think it's a fair comment. Like WordPress, people find really, really simple and easy to use. I think you can get there with Drupal as well. Um, certainly Drupal 8 offers a lot more benefits in terms of content editing and, and publishing the over, over Drupal 7. Um, the other thing is looking at your user types and how, who they are and how they're actually editing that content, whether you want to give them that, that WYSIWYG only editor, don't even let them get into the back end necessarily, depending on how technical they are, is something that we see a lot. So if, you, if your users aren't particularly technical and they don't want to see all that, all the, all the back end stuff in Drupal, you can just provide that kind of front end interface for them to, to edit content and things as well. And that's a real quick, quick and easy solution. And also looking at Drupal 8 and some of the modules and improvements around the user interface that were done in that has made a big difference to, to a lot of users as well. I think the big corporate end of town really likes um, Adobe um, and Sitecore. Um, and I think, but more and more you see Drupal competing in those corporate spaces because of the, um, basically because of the, the lack of a license cost. So the, the licenses for those products can be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars even, um, depending on exactly how you're gonna license and build them. Um, so I certainly see um, Drupal and, and the platforms around Drupal, particularly those those um, companies that are offering, I guess, a range of services wrapped up on top of the Drupal platform, is something that um, that that Drupal is really competing in that space. I think the other side to it, where probably the commercial platforms are a little bit ahead ahead of Drupal and ahead of the open source platforms, is in the kind of personalization and marketing automation side of things. Yes, there are modules in Drupal, and there are. Um, things like Acquia Lift and stuff, which do a, a degree of personalization, but they're reasonably immature compared to the commercial offerings. So if your site requires a huge amount of personalization of content, if you're um, trying to work with three or four different audiences and you have almost different sites for those different audiences and you're marketing and you have a whole marketing automation around how you market with those sites and things, that's where the, the kind of corporate offering seems to go beyond what the open source um, offering does as well. So something to think about if that's where your organisation is going or if that's what you're trying to achieve, that sometimes the commercial products can do a little bit more than the open source ones as well. I think it's a, it's a valid point. I think you need to look at the government obviously is a little bit more heavily regulated than some of the corporate spaces. So going in and just picking any module you like and, and then going off and doing a, a security ass assessment on it can be quite timely and, and um, take, a, take a fair amount of time and be quite, um, take a fair amount of cost as well. So if you're going to go through that, the defence process of, of getting your site certified, if you're going to do that, that can take months and months and months on top of it. Um, I think to start with, you need to understand what the purpose and vision of your site is trying to achieve. So if it's a, a site that is gonna create, capture personal information, um, looking at the controls around, yeah, what sorts of information, unclassified and all that kind of things, making sure that you do comply with those different things. I don't think it's impossible to do those things in Drupal and certainly there are lots of examples where you can do it. It's just a question of um, working with your provider to understand those controls that are in place. So yeah, if you're looking at the ASD certifications around, um, around that, it's just going to add a little bit of time and cost into what you're doing. So you can go off and pick those modules, but then once you build the whole solution, when you're doing your testing, your penetration testing, and all those things, you probably want to go through that, that certification process at the end of it as well. Um, if it's something like a simple content site, though, you don't generally have to go through those necessarily either. So it's really only when you're adding and capturing that kind of um, personal information or integrating it off into other systems that you might want to think about, about that side of things. So I, the way I see it working, I guess, and the way um, if you're having a site where 
um, you can integrate voice control into it. So if a user is on your, mainly not so much on websites, like direct websites, more if you're on your phone or something and you're like, oh, show me you know, 10,000 kittens or whatever it is, the search engine that comes up and you just speak it into the phone, you're out and about, all of a sudden you get those results directly on your phone. So if you're searching for a product and things like that, um, it's actually a really fast and easy way to search. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm not huge, a huge fan of this, but a lot of the millennials and things are on their phones speaking into their phones to engage with them rather than necessarily you know, typing or swiping on the keyboard kind of thing as well. So it's about that whole how they engage with the device and how they engage with the site is getting an understanding that not everyone's going to be using a mouse or keyboard to type in those things. They're going to be um, providing um, voice input into that and giving a way that that voice control actually works. So testing it with voice input, making sure that it does return sensible things like that as well. Um, so over time, you know, we're seeing a big uptake of those kind of voice related technologies and that's something I think for the next few years to think about is designing uh, an interface that will work for voice, not just work for mouse, keyboard or even swipe. Yeah, I, it's actually funny, I think if you look at web technologies 10 or 15 years ago, that was actually what the norm was and then it disappeared for a while, everyone was building everything into the CMS and the CMS offered both the front and back end of the site. I think the concept of what you're talking about in, in terms of headless CMS and having that ability to decouple your, your front end from your back end is, is super useful if you want to have a way to kind of... Um, I guess keep your design language refreshed so that you can always update your front end but keep your business processes underneath at the back end. Um, I think it works really, really nicely yeah, in those examples where say you're going to build a more complicated system and it might take a long time to actually build all the business functionality in the back end and you're decoupling that front end of it so you can go off and refresh the design language, refresh your style sheets, refresh the whole front, front end really, really easily. Because what you see a lot is I guess systems that were built in a kind of integrated way if it's a you know if it's a one to two year project to rebuild the whole thing, no one ever wants to start that project. If it's a three month project to just go off and redesign the front end, and you've decoupled that from your back end, you can improve your user experience very very easily just by doing that. So I think it's, it's a, there's a real kind of shift to do that again, and I think it is important probably more in those kind of business application spaces and things like that to really decouple that that from your back end. Come and have a chat. That's fine. Yeah. yeah so 